Hello, beautiful souls. My name is Carolyn. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. This channel is all about true crime, mystery, and anything abnormal. If you're a returning subscriber, thank you so much. And if you're new to the channel, I definitely recommend subscribing because this channel is definitely a vibe. Jason Massey was born in 1973 in Huntsville, Texas. He was born to a mother that was already struggling with drug addiction. Jason had six siblings, but before his birth, five of those children had been taken away from the mother by Child Protective Services. So when Jason came along, it was just him, his sister, and his mom. Jason did not know who his biological father was. He only had very faint, brief memories of his father and the only thing he ever remembered was that his father was abusive to him. When Jason was still an infant, his mother would leave him and his sister in the car while she would go into bars to party, giving very much Casey Anthony vibes. The family never had a stable home. They would bounce around to different relatives and friends homes. Sometimes they would end up living in their car and sometimes they would rent motel rooms and briefly they would have an apartment, but this never was consistent in his life. It was just him constantly moving between different places. He definitely did not grow up in a stable environment. Jason and his sister from a very young age would be left home alone and their mother would leave for hours with them having no idea where she was or when she would return. Food was also very, very limited. Whatever food they did have, the mother would hide the food in her bedroom so that the children could not eat it. And anytime if the children were ever caught going in her bedroom because they were literally starving, she would beat them. So we're definitely not starting off good. On rare occasions when the mother would have someone watch the children when she went out, it would always be males and they would always essay Jason. So I don't think she was actually getting babysitters to watch the kids. I think maybe these were men who had interests in young boys and the mother was giving opportunity to them to spend time with her son. The mother was never charged with this and there was nothing really confirming that. That in my opinion is what appears to have been what was going on. Jason's grandmother was a Christian and though she was not abusive, she would fill his head with stories of Satan and hell and demons. And this led Jason to believe that demons were talking to him. So to say the very least, Jason had a very, very difficult childhood. And as a child, Jason developed very strong antisocial behaviors. When he did go to school, he would be dirty, unfed, covered in bruises. And this was reported in so many of the sources that I read while I was researching this story. And I'm just wondering why no one ever reported it. I couldn't find anything anywhere where it said that anyone had ever reported the abuse or that anything was done in any way to help Jason with the abuse that he was suffering. And Jason, very early on in life, his way of dealing with being a victim was that he was gonna turn around and he was gonna be the victimizer. His entire childhood, he would bully kids horribly. He would beat children up all the time. He was very much feared by most children who knew him. He was taking the abuse that he suffered and inflicting it on others. And I'll just give a small trigger warning for animals. If uh, you don't wanna hear it, just fast forward about 10 seconds, because this does come up quite a few times in this story, but it is important to the story to know these details. But if you don't wanna hear them, just fast forward about 10 seconds. 
Jason's favorite pastime was torturing and mutilating animals. He hunted animals to fulfill his sadistic sexual urges that he was having very young. He got a lot of joy out of inflicting pain on other people and animals. He got a lot of satisfaction and he really, really enjoyed seeing animals or other people in pain. And it was a sexual gratification to him. When Jason was 12 years old, he developed a crush on a little girl that was in his class at school. But when she wanted nothing to do with him, he had no idea how to deal with rejection. Like, let's face it, this kid doesn't know how to deal with anything. He's been abused since he was born. So he doesn't know how to deal with any emotions on any level. But this was the first time he was getting rejection from someone he had had a crush on. Jason would stalk the young girl. He would also call her threatening and saying very obscene things. And this little girl's only 12 and Jason's young too. Like these aren't, these are still pretty young kids that this is happening to. And he would write notes to this poor little 12 year old girl talking about all of the violent things that he wanted to do to her and saying that he wanted to kill her and drink her blood. Just really messed up stuff. The one thing he seemed to fixate the most on or seemed to be at this time his biggest fantasy was to slit someone's throat preferably a young female, and drink their blood. And after she refused to date him, uh, just to give another trigger warning for animals, just fast forward about five seconds, this girl didn't want to be his girlfriend, and she told him that. So what he did was he went to her house, killed her dog, and put the blood of the dog all over the family car. By his teen years, Jason was drinking and doing drugs daily. He would drink any alcohol he could get his hands on and he would do any drugs he could get his hands on. He also had a very strong interest in heavy metal bands, Satanism and serial killers. And if you've seen my videos before, you know I very firmly believe music does not cause anyone to commit these types of violent crimes. But Jason was obsessed with Slayer. And that comes up again later in the story. But what I think was really dangerous was his obsession with serial killers. He really idolized serial killers. And he really idolized the serial killers of that time. His three favorites seemed to be Charles Manson, Ted Bundy and Henry Lee Lucas. And not only did he admire them, he inspired to be like them. Maybe you should be, aspire to be like Slayer and become a musician maybe, instead of the serial killer thing. Just a thought. Jason was 16 when he dropped out of school and he got a job working as a roofer. This is also when Jason started to keep diaries in spiral notebooks. And on the front of the notebooks, it would say the Slayer's Death Book, volume one through four. Sorry folks, no, it's not available on Amazon. Two years later, Jason's mother found these notebooks and she was shocked and horrified by the disturbing, dark, disgusting ideas, thoughts, and plans that Jason had. The four notebooks contained over 500 pages of Jason's dark fantasies. And as soon as his mother read these, she knew she had a big problem and there was something extremely wrong with Jason. The notebooks detailed his sick obsession with becoming a serial killer. 
in the books he had written, he wanted to kill 700 people in 20 years. Reach for the stars, guys. I'm just kidding. Don't, don't, don't. He wrote a lot about his frustration that he hadn't killed someone yet. He was very disappointed in himself that he had not, as of yet, killed anyone. He wrote that he wanted to lash out on society and to reap immense sorrow and suffering. Okie dokie, Jason. The journals also listed out specific girls that he knew, most of them who he had gone to school with, and these were his hopefully in his mind, his future victims. And every girl on this list was between the ages of 10 and 13. He wrote that he loved these girls, but that he needed to possess them. And in order to possess them, he needed to kill them. To him, killing was the only way that he could be a man. If you ever feel the need to be a man, bro, you're lame. This is another animal trigger. Go ahead about 10 seconds if you don't wanna hear it. He had listed in the diary all of the animals that he had killed. He had killed 41 cats, 26 dogs, and seven cows. He also wrote how he had removed their heads and kept all of the heads as trophies. And then he decided, well, I'm going to be a little smarty pants. If I want to be a serial killer, I need to study police procedure. So he read and tried to learn as much as he could to avoid getting caught once he started to commit his crimes. Probably the most disturbing part of the diaries were the detailed plans of how he planned to kill each of the girls that he had listed. He would go into extensive detail, detailing which weapons he wanted to use on which girls, exactly the acts that he wanted to commit on those girls, and it was really detailed. So after his mother had found the diaries, she decided this kid needs a psychiatrist and she was right. When he went to the psychiatrist very quickly, the psychiatrist determined that he was a danger to others. He was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and he was admitted into a psychiatric intensive unit. So again, you think, oh, maybe this boy will get some help. As always, nope. So when he got into this psychiatric unit, he was seen by many different psychiatrists and all of the psychiatrists disagreed on what was wrong with him. They all agreed that he was definitely mentally ill and he definitely needed help but they argued over what his specific diagnosis should be. And because they couldn't agree, they released him. Like this guy is so disturbed that you have a group of psychiatrists who are all agreeing that this man is very disturbed and needs a lot of help, but they can't all agree on the same diagnosis. So their solution is to just let him leave. Like, I don't understand what logic is that, but that's what was done. After he was released, and at this point he's 18 years old in the story, he ends up meeting a woman and they decide to move in together. But this did not last long. The woman had caught him doing evil things to a dog. And... She hightailed it out of there real fast. In 1993, Jason was pulled over by a cop while he was driving. When the cop pulled him over, 
In the passenger seat of his car was a kitty who was no longer alive. There was a noose, a knife, and a list of girls' names with check marks beside them. If that doesn't scream psycho, I don't know what does. And for this, he was put in jail for a short period of time. While he was in jail, he just read and researched about police procedures and reading and learning more about guns. He also continued writing about his plans to be a serial killer. On June 17, 1993, a younger boy, Christopher Nolan, asked Jason to give him a ride to go and visit his girlfriend. Jason is 21 at this point, and he agrees to give this boy a ride. When Jason met Christina Benjamin, he started flirting with her as soon as he met her, and she was only 13 years old, and he was also meeting her with her boyfriend. The three of them talked about sneaking out, and this really excited Christina because she had never done anything like this before. And I don't know if you're like me when you were a young teen, the idea of sneaking out of the house and it was, you know, it's kind of exciting and fun. I remember we used to sneak out of the house and go like hang out on a playground in the middle of the night just because, you know, it was exciting and fun and thrilling. So Christina really wanted to sneak out one night. And as soon as Jason noticed how excited Christina was to do this, he told her he would return later that night. He would come to her house, honk twice. She would come outside and then they would go off into the night and have an exciting time. And this poor girl, she probably just thinks she's gonna go drive around or hang out somewhere in a park. And it's going to be a really exciting, thrilling night. She had no idea what she was going to end up experiencing. The three of them hung out for a while. And then Jason and Christopher took Christina home. And Jason told her he would be back later that night to pick her up so they could sneak out together. On the drive home, Jason told Christopher that he would like to have sex with Christina, kill Christina and chop her up, not necessarily in that order. Christopher Nolan would later testify to this and he said he really didn't think much of it because Jason talked about things like this all the time. He told the court that Jason was weird and he talked about killing girls a lot. So when he said this to him, he didn't really take him too serious because he'd heard him say it so many times before. On July 27th, 1993, James King and his wife, Donna Benjamin, went to sleep that night with their windows open. It was a very hot summer night. James awoke at 2 a.m. to hear two car horn beeps. He went to the window and he saw his son talking to someone in a tan suburban. It had been so hot out that night, his son had decided to sleep on a hammock in the front yard. James then went to the washroom and when he came back to the window, the suburban and his son were both gone. James stayed awake for about an hour waiting on his son, but when he hadn't returned, he just decided to go to sleep. The next morning, James and Donna, who are the parents, realized that Brian, who was the son, is not home. They couldn't find him. But even stranger to them is they realized their daughter, Christina, is not home either. They were very worried, but they decided to give it a little bit of time because they really did believe that the two kids would just come home soon. Maybe this was just some innocent teen fun, but unfortunately, no. 
When both Brian and Christina had not returned home by mid-afternoon, the parents knew something was wrong, so they contacted the police to report the kids missing. Two days later, a road worker in Telco, Texas, found the body of a deceased girl. She was missing her head and her hands, and she was naked. When police arrived and started searching the area, they found a deceased boy as well. He was clothed and had been shot twice in the head. Using a library card that was found in his pocket, the boy was identified as Brian James. Using hair found in a nearby fence and an X-ray of the foot, the young naked girl who was deceased was identified as Brian's stepsister, Christina Benjamin. Because Brian's body was found clothed and shot twice in the head, police believed that he was killed just to get him out of the way because Christina's body was a completely different story. It was obvious that she was the target and someone had taken out extreme sadistic rage on this poor young girl's body. Christina had been shot as well, but she also had a cut from her pelvis to her breasts. Her nipples had been cut off and there were very precise, specific cuts made to her genitalia. Even though her body was mutilated in that way, the medical examiner did not find signs that she had actually been essayed. Police found a single blonde hair on Brian that didn't belong to Brian or Christina. They also found a tiny tan fiber on the bottom of his shoe. They had found bullet fragments in both of their bodies and they could tell that they had been shot with a 22 caliber gun. Police then interviewed Brian and Christina's friends to try to find out if they knew anything that the parents didn't know. And friends of both of them had said that Brian and Christina had both planned together to sneak out that night with an older boy named Jason. The friends didn't know Jason, they had just been told his name by Brian and Christina. Police also received an anonymous phone call suggesting that they look into Jason Massey. The police also interviewed Jason's friends and his friends told the police that Jason had a big obsession with talking about animals that he had killed. None of them had ever seen it, but Jason had told all of them that he had a really large metal cooler out in the woods that he was keeping the heads of all the animals in. So the police now are looking for Jason Massey and they have put his picture on the television and in the newspaper to see if they could get the public's help in locating him. A few days after the murder, a car wash owner called the police and said that a young man had come up to his business and thrown away a bunch of stuff in his garbage. And he believed that it was Jason Massey from the picture that he had seen in the newspaper. So the police head to the gas station to look through the garbage to see what he had thrown away. When police went through the trash, they found a red bandana with blonde hairs in it. They also found a pay stub from KFC with Jason Massey's name on it. As well, they found a business card for Jason Massey's probation officer. Police were finally able to locate Jason and they brought him in for questioning and Jason just denied everything. As they always do. A search warrant was issued for his tan suburban and his home. Police found out that Jason had recently stolen a 22 caliber gun from his cousin and he had shown it 
to a few of his friends. And if you remember, it was the same caliber of gun that was used to kill both Brian and Christina. When police searched Jason's home, they found a Walmart receipt that told them a lot. The receipt was for ammunition for a 22 caliber gun, handcuffs, and two hunting knives. When they searched his Suburban, they found spots of blood all over the place, and they also found a hunting knife in the glove box. For the guy who had studied police procedure so he could get away with all of these killings, he was not doing a very good job hiding his crimes. Thankfully, he wasn't too bright. In his trunk, they found duct tape, they found a screwdriver, and they found a head of a hammer which matched up to an injury that was on Christina's body. All items tested positive for human blood and they were able to match it to Christina's DNA. Jason was charged with first degree murder and even though there was a mountain of evidence, he decided to plead not guilty. The psychiatrist that he had seen when he was younger went on the stand and testified in a lot of detail about Jason's obsession with killing animals and his desire to kill young girls and very much believed that he was definitely a danger to the public. During the trial, a hunter had found the big metal cooler that Jason had talked about to his friends before. Inside were the heads of all of the animals that he had killed as well as the four volumes of Slayer's Book of Death, which again is the detailed diary of all the sick shit this crazy mofo wanted to do. Jason was found guilty of capital murder. Before sentencing, the jury was read parts of these diaries that Jason had written. On October 12, 1994, it took the jury less than 15 minutes to sentence Jason to death. On April 3rd, 2001, Jason was put to death by lethal injection, and this was witnessed by Christina Benjamin and Brian King's family and loved ones. Burn in hell, mofo. And his final statement was just a whole lot of BS. I'm not even going to go over it. The only thing that of any significance he said was that he said that he had thrown Christina's head and hands in a river because they had not been found at this point. But the police did not believe that he had thrown her head or her hands in the river. They believe that he had buried them in the woods so that he could go back later and fulfill his sick sexual fantasies. But unfortunately, the police were never able to find her head or her hands. Hopefully, Christina and Brian's family can find some peace knowing that Jason is dead. And yeah, it was... Today was a rough story for sure. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like. If you'd like to see more from me, please subscribe and I will see you in the next one.